Welcome, everyone, to our last installment of our First John Sermon Series. I'm Pastor Augie, and today we're going to be wrapping up this whole sermon series. This is week 22 of this message series, and today we're going to be looking at chapter 5, verse 18 through 21. Now, my title for today is Don't Forget, because basically what John's going to be saying is, listen, don't forget about these things that I've taught you, and so we're going to spend our time this morning looking at chapter 5, verse 18 through 21. 1 John chapter 5, verse 18 says this. It says, We know that God's children do not make a practice of sinning, for God's Son holds them securely, and the evil one cannot touch them. We know that we are children of God and that the world around us is under the control of the evil one. And then verse 20. And we know that the Son of God has come, and He has given us understanding so that we can know the true God. And now we live in fellowship with the true God because we live in fellowship with His Son, Jesus Christ. He is the only true God, and He is eternal life. Dear children, keep away from anything that might take God's place in your hearts. So what John is doing here this morning is he's taking us back to where he's already been. He's reminding us of the things that he's already taught us. And so he spends these last few verses saying, hey, don't forget about these things that I've already told you and already taught you. And so let's jump into the first one there in verse 18. It says this, it says, we know that God's children do not make a practice of sinning for God's son holds them securely and the evil one cannot touch them. Now we talked about this in week 11. Our true believer statement for that day was true believers do not practice sin. We see John talk about this time and time again in this letter. He talks about it in chapter 1, verse 8 through 10. He talks about it in chapter 2. He talks about it in chapter 3. In fact, John pretty much says the exact same thing here in chapter 3, verse 9. Let me read it for you. It says, Those who have been born into God's family do not make a practice of sinning. He's talking about that continually practicing sin. Continuing, because of God's life is in them. So they can't keep on sinning because they are children of God. That's why our true believer statement for that time was true believers do not practice sin. Now John's point here is direct. It's absolutely direct to the first readers and to us today. Because what he's trying to do there is he's trying to correct the false teaching that had been going on for a long time now. And that false teaching was that my body and my soul and my spirit, they're separate. And so whatever I do in my body is separate from my spirit. And so I can sin in my body and it not affect me spiritually. Now that was absolutely a false teaching. And this is part of his point that, listen, a true believer does not keep practicing sin. Now the argument could be there, especially in Ephesus, that I could go and lay with a temple prostitute, and that was okay because that was just my body. That was a bodily thing, not a spirit thing. And John's like, no, 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 man, that's not how things work. True believers do not practice sin. You see, the Gnostics there were teaching that whatever I did here in my body on earth, it was not that big of a deal. There, there was no connection to the spirit world. And in fact, they were saying, remember, we, t- we, already, lo- we already talked about this, that Jesus was really not even, he was not even human. He was just spirit. And so this teaching was, was pervasive in the church. And what John is doing here is he's reminding them. He's reminding them, he's saying, remember what we talked about, that true believers do not practice sin. Now, if you think about this concept, this is a very, very serious and a very practical problem for John and the church at Ephesus, because at Ephesus, there was the temple of Artemis or the temple of Diana. And this is the little G God of many things, but one of the things that Diana was known for was being the god, little g god, of fertility. And so in Ephesus, there was this really big temple, and people would come from all over the place to come and visit the temple and worship the little g god, Artemis or Diana. Now, the god of fertility, the way that you worshiped the god of fertility, was through different sexual acts. And there were all kinds of temple prostitutes there that you could worship with. And of course, 
these Gnostics who are teaching these people at the church at Ephesus that, you know, whatever happens with your body is separate from your spirit. This was a very, very real and serious concern for John because his church folk are there and they're living in the middle of this basically constant ongoing orgy. And he wants to remind them, listen, this is not how true believers live. True believers do not practice sin. So let's move forward into the text into verse 19. It says this, We know that we are children of God and that the world around us is under the control of the evil one. Now John is reminding them again. Remember we're saying, so you can remember, so don't forget about these things. Uh, He's reminding them this teaching that he's already put down. And he's saying, there are really only two positions. You're either for God or you're against God. And we've already looked at this before. You're either for God or against God. And he talks about these things. He's saying there's no middle ground. And he talks about them in chapter 2, verse 15, chapter 3, verse 1 and 13, chapter 4, verses 4 and 5, and then chapter 5, verses 4 and 5. Let me share what he's already said here in chapter 2, 15. He says, Do not love the world nor the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. Now, see, we love to stand between two things. I mean, we all love to do this, and this is why John's writing to them. Even you and I today love to stand between two things. We love to stand in the middle. Uh, say, for instance, you know, you're, you're looking for a new home, and, and, and you really want to be out in the counties, kind of away from everyone, but you also want to be close to the grocery store, right? You can't have it both ways. Uh, when my wife and I are trying to plan vacation, uh, she likes to be at the beach and I like to be at the mountains. You can't really have that both ways. Now, those are kind of easy things, not in your face kind of things to talk about. But, but what if I were to ask you, you know, how do you feel about God running your life, but you wanting to run your own? We love to stand in the middle there. We want to follow God, but we also want to be our own boss. Uh, We can't stand in the middle there. I've seen bumper stickers, and you probably have too, that say, God is my co-pilot. Well, no, God is supposed to be your pilot. A true believer in Jesus is going to have God as their pilot, not their co-pilot. But that's what we want. We want to be in the middle. We want God right next to us, but we don't want him leading us. Or what about those of us that continue to say, God, I I, want to follow you. I want to stop sinning. I want to get away from those temptations but we fail to you know, remove ourselves from the bad situations. We keep going to those same places, keep hanging out with those same friends, keep watching those same television shows. We love to stand in the middle, and I believe the people there in Ephesus love to stand in the middle as well. And that's why John is saying, you cannot have it both ways. The reality for us all is this, is that you can't have your cake and eat it too, right? You just can't. And that phrase is really old. It's from the 1500s. But I think you understand what we're saying when we say that. You can't have it both ways. You are either for God or you're against him. Now, I shared this a few weeks ago that, that for me, what John's really talking to people that were like me for so many years. He's talking to people that, that really just wanted Jesus as a Savior, but not as a Lord. And that's how I lived for so many years. I wanted Jesus to save me from hell, but I really didn't want to live for him. I didn't want to do what he told me to do. I didn't want to, you know, not do the things he told me not to. I just wanted him to save me from the punishment, but I really didn't want to follow him. And I think John is writing to people in Ephesus who he knows are the very same way. And we talked about this, like I said, a few weeks ago, that many of us, I feel like many of us are that way. We want Jesus to be our Lord, and we want Him to be our Savior, but not necessarily our Lord. And that's what John is getting at here. You can't have it both ways. You are either for God or you're against Him. Let's jump to verse 20. It says this, And we know that the Son of God has come, and He has given us understanding so that we can know the true God. And now we live in fellowship with the true God because we live in fellowship with His Son, Jesus Christ. He is the only true God, and He is eternal life. I taught on this a few weeks ago that knowing was very important to John, and he's talking here, he's 
He's so far, he's, uh, he's reminding us three things that we know. This is the third thing that we know. And here he uses two different words, though, for the word know. Let's look at them. He, sa- he starts out and says, and we know. Now, this Greek word is edo. And this word here that he uses is, is to, to know things, you know, to know things absolutely without a, without a shadow of a doubt. That's what this word Edo is, but then he changes the word. Now in English, we just have the word no, but he changes the word here in the second part of that verse, and it says, so that we can know the true God. Now this is the word gnosko, gnosko. Now this word is actually knowledge gained by experience. This is, this is knowing something or someone intimately and relationally. And so if you see here, we know, it says this, and we know that the Son of God has come. So we know that. This is something that's absolute for us. It's something, it's solid, it's a matter of fact. And he has given us understanding so that we can gnosko the true God, that we can know by experience, that we can know relationally, not just intellectually. Now that word gnosko sounds a lot like the Spanish word, conozco. I don't know if you speak Spanish. I speak a little bit of Spanish, but in Spanish, there are two words. There are actually many words for the word to know. In English, we just say, well, I know that I like chips and salsa, or I know you, or I know that I like the doubt. You know, whatever it is, you just know things, and there's different connotations to that word. But in Spanish, you and, and obviously in Greek and Hebrew, you use different words to know things differently. But if you're going to talk about somebody, you use the verb conocer, which sounds a lot like, if you say yo conozco, that sounds an awful like gnosco there, right? Because in Spanish, when you're talking about people or places that you're familiar with, you change the word. And that's interesting, right? That's interesting that John here is saying that we can know for sure. We can know without a shadow of a doubt that we can gnosko, that we can know in true relationship the God of the universe through his son, Jesus. This is an awesome privilege for the true believer. Look at this quote that I found from pastor and Christian author, uh, David Jackman. It says this, it says, understanding Christian truth is not a matter of mastering doctrinal formulations, important as they are or of grasping philosophical ideas like those the Gnostics propagated. But here's what it is. But it is of meeting, knowing, and submitting to the person who is truth, so that we may know him who is true. There is great importance in reading and studying and knowing this book. But there is greater importance in knowing the author. You see, we can study this book so that way we can know all these verses and, and impress our Christian friends with how many verses we know. And you know, that whatever, that's okay. We can, we can look in here and study it and try to dive into the deep things of, of the Bible and learn all the stories and impress people with our knowledge. Uh, you may even dive into the scriptures to, to look for the inconsistencies and things like that. But listen, There is nothing more important than this book, looking at it from a perspective, studying it from a perspective of knowing the author. And the author is the God of life. And that's what John is getting at here. He's saying that a true believer can know God, that you can know God through his son, Jesus. You can know him relationally, and you can experience him relationally through his son, Jesus. And so for the true believer, the true believer knows God. Let's finish up with the last verse, verse 21. It says this, Dear children, keep away from anything that might take God's place in your hearts. Now the other versions, many other versions will say something like this. This is what it says in the New American Standard version. It says, Little children, guard yourself from idols. And at first glance, it kind of seems like, as I read it, it kind of seemed like John just kind of threw that out there. It's just like, oh yeah, don't forget this. 
stay away from idols. It's really kind of one of those, oh, and, and this. It's kind of like an add-on. But really, it's not an add-on at all because John has been spending this entire letter talking about the true God, the true God that believers get to love and get to worship and get to experience and know. And so what he's saying here is like, we've talked about the true God. Don't fall for the false gods. Don't fall for the false idols. Now, an idol is anything, what it says here, that can take God's place in your hearts. An idol is anything that can take God's place in your hearts. Now, very, very practically for the people at Ephesus, this could be a very, very practical problem. And so for John, he wants to remind them again. He's reminded, this is, this is what this final section is, a constant reminder of what's going on. And so he's saying, listen, in Ephesus, remember, there's all these craftsmen all over. Remember the, the temple of Artemis is there? And so there'd be craftsmen all over. There'd be silversmiths and, and, and all kinds of artisans there creating these little idols of Diana or Artemis there because people would flock from all the surrounding regions to go there as a destination place. It'd be like when you go down to Algodonas or San Luis and you go shopping and there's all, th all kinds of things to buy, little, you know, little trinkets and things like that. Uh, because these places would have had those. These artisans would be selling these little idols all over the place for people to take home, to worship in their own home. And so this is a very practical issue for John, but it's also a spiritual one. It's also something that he wants to get at in our own hearts, right? In our own hearts. Now, you probably, most likely, do not have a bunch of silver statues all over your house. I mean, if you do, whatever. But most of you probably don't. And so does this really apply to us? It absolutely applies to us. Because like John said, we want to keep away from anything that might take God's place in our hearts. That's what an idol is. I think for a lot of us, we have lots of stuff that takes God's place in our hearts. And that can be stuff like your, uh, I don't know, your, your quads or your boat or the toys that you have. It could even be your relationship. It could be your job or the education that you're pursuing. There are so many things in our lives that compete with God for our attention. And what John is saying here is he's saying, listen, the true believer keeps God first. The true believer worships God alone. And so that's what he's saying to us today. And it's absolutely imperative for us to remember that true believers, that true, true, true believers worship God alone. So as we wrap up this entire series, 22 weeks of working through 1 John, here's your final true believer statement. And it's this, that true believers keep God first. True believers keep God first. If we will keep God first in all things, we're going to be productive. We're going to be people that, that do the things that God is calling us to do. We're going to be people that don't do the things that God forbids. We're going to be people that go out and be like Jesus in the way that we interact with people. We're going to do those things. We're going to be good to people that are bad to us. We're going to offer grace and mercy in times of crisis when no one else is. We're going to love like Jesus did. We do all of those things by keeping God first. And so that's how we're going to close this series. Now, as I think about the next series coming up, we've been talking today about the true and living God. As I think about this next series coming up, this Moss Christmas series, it's really about the true and living God coming to earth, coming to earth as a human little baby. And he came to earth on a mission, on a rescue mission for you and for me. And so what we're going to do in that Moss Christmas series is look at Jesus' birth and his coming and, and how it was talked about for centuries before and what his coming means for you and me today. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for this series. I thank you for this letter of 1 John and how it talks to us as true believers. It tells us how we ought to live, what we ought to do and not do. 
I pray, God, that over the last year as we've studied this, Father, that there will be people that are closer and closer to you because of these things that we work through. Father, I thank you for the times that you convicted me as I've studied these passages, and I pray, God, that I can apply the lessons that you've taught me and also that our people can apply the lessons that you've taught them. Go before us, Father, empower us through your Holy Spirit to be who you want us to be in the community as we go to work, as we go to school, as we go to do the different things that we're going to be doing, Father. Empower us through your Holy Spirit to be more and more like your Son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thanks for joining us today. I want to encourage you to continue to watch and engage online. I love you guys, and I'll see you next week.